the late uh, Francis Cardinal George was obviously a great man, a cardinal of the Roman Church, a past president of the United States uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, certainly the intellectual leader of the American Church, one of the most consequential churchmen of his time. A number of bishops have said to me over the years that at their national gatherings, many bishops would speak, but when Cardinal George rose to speak, everybody listened. The whole room went silent because they recognized him as their leader. I remember Archbishop Shapu of uh, Philadelphia saying to me in reference to Cardinal George, well, he was the best and brightest of us. So I think that's how the, his own uh, colleagues saw him. But to understand this uh, great man, I think we have to go back to when he was a kid, around the age of 13, at St. Pascal's Parish on the northwest side of Chicago. A kid who loved to ride his bike and to run around with his friends, who was quite a gifted uh, pianist, who was also a, uh, a painter. This 13-year-old uh, kid is stricken with polio, which almost killed him and left him um, severely disabled. Running around and bike riding and painting and piano playing were permanently behind him. It would have been very easy for this young man basically to give up, to withdraw. He did anything but. Um, pressed forward with enormous determination. And the deepest desire of his heart when he was that age was to be a priest. This desire brought him to um, Quigley Seminary, the high school seminary in Chicago, and the uh, powers that be turned him down. And not, not of meanness of spirit, they felt this young kid with crutches and a brace couldn't make the difficult commute to school every day, couldn't get through the program, so they turned him down. So he went to the uh, Oblates of Mary Immaculate, a religious order, a missionary order, and he joined them and he came of age and became a priest under their aegis. Now, I go back to this point in Cardinal George's life because it sheds light on two extremely important features of his life. First of all, he was a man who never gave up, starting at age 13 and going on throughout his life. I had the privilege for about seven years to live a part-time uh, at Cardinal George's house, so I saw his life close up. His was a life of morning, noon, and night, constant activity and obligation. Public speeches, gatherings, conferences, individual conversations, liturgies, morning, noon, and night, pretty much Sunday through Sunday. I can say this with absolute honesty. Never once in seven years, seeing the man close up, never once did I ever hear him complain about what he had to do. He just did it, and not with grim determination, but with a sense of purpose, of mission. And that brings me now to the second point, the OMIs, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, a missionary congregation. So this young kid goes down to um, Belleville, Illinois, where they had their uh, novitiate, and there he took in the spirit of this congregation. He heard the stories of OMI missionaries who had traveled all over the world, in Asia, in Africa, in Alaska, every place, Texas, throughout our country. And what he imbibed was the adventurous spirit of this community. When in time he became the um, vicar general of the OMIs, even though he was restricted by his own disability, nevertheless, he traveled in a missionary spirit to all those places. One thing that always amazed me about Cardinal George was his command of culture, country, history. Name any place in the world. He knew its background, knew the language, everything about it. And it was born not just of books, but of a lot of very direct experience. He had a missionary heart, a missionary elan. And this provides the key to his uh, principal intellectual and pastoral project, which was the evangelization of the culture. Cardinal George was a student of culture. His doctorate was in American philosophy. He knew the intellectual underpinnings of our culture remarkably well. And one thing I know that really bugged him, because he said it directly to me several times, he hated being characterized, as he often was in the press, as countercultural or a culture warrior. He said to me many times, you cannot evangelize a culture you don't love. And so to say you're simply a culture warrior 
not only is it evangelically a counterproductive, it's, a, it's, it's silly. It's a bit like saying a, a, a fish swims athwart the ocean. I mean, the culture is, is the ocean that we, we swim in. And so you can't simply be a culture warrior. And indeed, Cardinal George was not. He was aware of dangers and limitations and, and problems in the culture, but he was also someone who celebrated elements of the contemporary culture. And here he comes very close to his mentor and hero, namely John Paul II, who gave us this great mission, really, of evangelizing the culture. What are things that Cardinal George appreciated about contemporary modern culture? Well, there are many. I'll just name a couple. One was this keen sense of the rights, freedom, and dignity of the individual. Go back here now to uh, the 18th century and the thought of Immanuel Kant. Kant, who in many ways is the mastermind of modern philosophy. And Kant takes as axiomatic that human beings have this irreducible dignity, that we cannot treat another human being as a means to a further end, but only as an end in himself. I know that sounds abstract, but it's see right out of the Bible that each individual human being has such an inherent dignity that he can't be used instrumentally but must be respected for his own inherent dignity. Now, Cardinal George contrasted that, by the way, with the more Hobbesian understanding of freedom and rights. I'm talking here about Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes who said, we have a right to that which we cannot not desire. And so famously, I can't not desire to live, therefore I've got a right to life. The problem with the Hobbesian view for the Cardinal was it was not grounded in the dignity of the individual, but in the kind of inevitability of desire. That led to a sort of skewed sense of freedom and um, individualism. So the Cardinal reverenced, as John Paul II did, the Kantian stress on the irreducible dignity of the individual. Rights, freedom, dignity, that was a great gift of modernity and one of the seeds of the word that he appreciated. Here's a second one. The sciences. Now go back to the 18th century, 19th century, and the rise of the physical sciences. They were not only of enormous descriptive power, they were of liberating power. How the scientists liberated us from um, cold and heat and from the environment and from uh, restriction. I can now get an airplane and fly far away. I can use a computer. I can communicate. We were liberated from so many of the strictures that were upon us uh, by nature. And so the scientists were descriptive, they were also liberating. And Cardinal George, um, along with the, the best of moderns, affirmed that and celebrated it. What he was worried about was a scientism that would reduce all forms of knowing to the scientific uh, manner of knowing, that would eliminate the poetic, the philosophical, and ultimately the religious. So he pulled back from that. But he was appreciative of these two great dimensions of modernity. Now, this leads me to maybe his most famous quote. He said, liberal Catholicism is an exhausted project. Now, I know everyone and his brother jumped on him by saying, well, so then you're just this reactive um, conservative that you hate the whole liberal project. No, no, we have to parse the language carefully. He didn't say liberalism is a failed project or a useless project. He said it was an exhausted project. Now, what do I mean here? Cardinal George, I think, was not a conservative. He was a post-liberal, meaning he appreciated the legitimate achievements of liberalism, but wanted to push beyond. He was aware of the limitations of the liberal project, even as he appreciated the gains of it. So what are the limitations that he puts his finger on? What are the um, signs, if you want, of the exhaustion of the project? Let me illustrate it with a couple of quotes from the Cardinal's writings. Here's, here's one of the signs of exhaustion. The liberal project has gone off the rails in the measure that, quote, it seems to interpret the Council, Vatican II, as a mandate to change whatever in the Church clashes with modern society. Now, see, the point he's making here is not, I'm just anti-modern society. It's using modernity as the measure of revelation. Rather than reading the signs of the times, that's fine, that's Vatican II. Now I'm using the present day as the criterion and measure for uh, religious truth. That's a liberalism that's gone awry, that's run amok. Here's the, a second sign. Again, I'm quoting the Cardinal. 
When the cultural fault line lies in a willingness to sacrifice even the gospel truth in order to safeguard personal freedom construed as choice, we have lost our way. That's very important, isn't it, what he's saying there? Freedom, great. As I mentioned, the Kantian thing and uh, freedom with its roots in uh, the dignity of the individual. All that is great, but when freedom is construed as choice and construed so absolutely that it trumps the objectivity of revelation, now we have a liberalism that's gone amok. And he was a prophet, because is that true in spades today? When my capacity to invent myself and define myself is the one non-negotiable. That's a liberalism that's, uh, that's lost its way. And the Cardinal was a vociferous opponent of that sort of self-asserting, self-elevating um, freedom. Freedom is always in correlation to the truth, to use John Paul's language. The Cardinal would have bought that um, completely. Here's something else that's interesting, as, as we notice the critique of liberalism. What liberals often overlooked was, the Cardinal was almost with equal vehemence critical of conservative Catholicism. And here's what he meant. When we tie Catholicism to a particular cultural form, for example, the Catholic Church in America of the 1950s, we have the same problem. We've now allowed a certain cultural moment to define Catholicism, rather than liberating Catholicism for its evangelical mission. So the Church of the 50s, well, that's as limited a cultural form as the Church of the Enlightenment, or the Church of the Middle Ages, or the Church of the Patristic Period, all of which had good and bad elements, none of which should be itself the measure of the Gospel. In that sense, he was as opposed to conservatism as he was to liberalism. What did he want? And again, a famous quote of his. Not liberal Catholicism, not conservative Catholicism. I want simply Catholicism. He wanted Catholicism in its fully integrated form. He wanted, in a way, to move beyond the usual liberal conservative uh, battle lines. Now, what are some of the marks of this simple Catholicism? And this is where he gets a little technical, but interesting. He talked about, in classical philosophy, you've got ends in se, which means being in itself. You have essay odd, which means being toward. He wanted the category of essay pair, P-E-R in Latin. It means being through. At the most basic understanding of being is a being through the other. That relationality belongs to the very heart of reality. What's the ground of this? The Trinity. The Trinity. God himself is a set of relationships. God himself is a play of Father, Son, and Spirit. Essay pair. More to it, that God gives rise to the universe and creates it from moment to moment ex nihilo, which means the being of the world is, as it were, through God. Keep going. Because all things are coming forth every moment from God, they are connected to each other. Essay pair. Relationality, one in the other, coherence. That's the mark of simply Catholicism. One of the marks, anyway. Can I share with you some language now from the Cardinal's own writing, which I think is really good, on this point? He says this, The Church is aware of herself as vital and so calls herself a body. The Church is aware of herself as personal and so calls herself a bride. The Church is aware of herself as a subject, as an active abiding presence that mediates a believer's experience, and so calls herself a mother. The Church is aware of herself as integrated, and so describes herself as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about that, all these words, you know, integrated, uh, other-oriented, uh, connected, linked, mother, relation, they're all the language of essay pair. It's all the language of one in the other, of relationality. That's what he saw as basic. The liberal conservative fight, in some ways, he found boring. I think it's fair to say. He wouldn't want to be characterized as a, a battling conservative against liberalism. That's way too crude a set of categories. He wanted to be seen as an advocate of simply Catholicism, which would then have a transformative effect on the culture. 
That's how he saw himself. I would say personally, Cardinal George was, for me, a great spiritual father. I knew him well, and he um, influenced me in, in extraordinary ways. I think in his, um, in his personal uh, devotion, in his absolute dedication to the mission, in his intellectual clarity, in all these ways, he shaped me. And I think the whole church owes him an enormous debt in the measure that he reminded us who we are and what our mission is.